Um, good evening or afternoon or morning, uh, wherever you're calling in from. Uh, my name is Spencer Ruckty. I'm the author events manager at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington, which happens to be celebrating its 25th year in business. Uh, and I just want to say on behalf of Third Place and our partners, a community bookstore in Brooklyn and the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith, we are very pleased to welcome uh, three incredible minds with us today. Uh, the great translator Maureen Freely, uh, the Turkish novelist Ayşegül Savas, and the critic Merve Emre for a discussion of Tezer Özlü's Turkish classic Cold Nights of Childhood as translated for the first time into English by Maureen Freely. Um, and I just have to say that this is my favorite kind of online programming that uh, we're able to provide uh, that is featuring a group of brilliant panelists talking in praise of a brilliant translation. Um, we've had similar uh, events uh, to discuss books uh, by Icelandic Nobel laureate uh, Haldor Laxness uh, for Philip Ruffin's translation of Salka Valka. Um, and also we had another great one uh, with uh, these bookstores for uh, the Norwegian great Jan Fossa for his masterpiece Septology as translated by Damien Searles. So it's wonderful to keep providing this kind of programming. Um, thank you for watching. Again, if you're just joining us, uh, feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, all three of these co-sponsoring stores have great virtual and in-person programming coming up. And in fact, on August 9th, <clears throat> this is yet to be announced, but we're gonna be co-hosting Mexican author Guadalupe Nettle. And as long as the date works out, fingers crossed, uh, her translator Rosalind Harvey for a talk on their book, Stillborn, which was shortlisted for the International Booker Prize. Um, I know personally that for third place books, it's been a very exciting year for international literature. Um, we've had the opportunities to host Romanian author Mircea Cărescu and Korean author Chan Myung Kwan here in Seattle. Um, I will be posting links to all three of our store's event calendars so you can follow us and see what's going on in your neighborhood. Um, as mentioned, the chat window is open and we encourage you to use it respectfully today. And during the last 15 minutes of our conversation, we will also have time for your questions. So um, please, if you have questions for our panelists this evening, please submit those to the Q&A window below. Uh, and a reminder that this event will be recorded. So if you miss anything, uh, we'll be emailing that recording to everyone who, <coughs> who registered. And of course, you can order Cold Nights of Childhood from your neighborhood independent bookstore. Um, every purchase you make supports the future of our author series. So uh, thank you. And now for some brief introduction of our panelists, we have first Maureen Freely, our star of the evening, um, a translator who grew up in Istanbul and now lives in England. Um, she is the author of seven novels and formerly the, was formerly the president and chair of English Pen. And she has translated many Turkish classics as well as Orhan Pamuk and recently Dawn by Sevgi Soizel published by Archipelago Books last year. She currently teaches at the University of Warwick. We also have with us Dr. Merve Emre, who is the Shapiro Silverberg Professor of Creative Writing and Criticism at Wesleyan University and the director of the Shapiro Senator, uh, Center for Creative Writing and Criticism. Uh, her books include Paraliterary, The Making of Bad Readers in Post-War America, The Personality Brokers, uh, The Ferrante Letters, and the annotated Mrs. Dalloway. Um, she has been awarded the Philip Leverhulme Prize and the Robert B. Silvers Prize for Literary Criticism, and she is the contributing writer at the New Yorker. And also joining us is Aisha Gul Savas, uh, the author of the novels Walking on the Ceiling and White on White, uh, the latter of which was praised widely by critics for its restrained style, its ambition, and its exploration of loneliness. Uh, her writing has appeared in the New Yorker, the Paris Review and The Guardian, amongst other publications, and she pens a wonderful introduction for Cold Nights of Childhood. Um, born in 1943, Tezer Oslu inspired a generation of feminist writers and readers, and Cold Nights is her first book to be translated into English, and I can think of few better presses to introduce her to an English reading audience than Transit Books, based out of Oakland, California. So please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Maureen, Merve and I should go to your screen. Thank you. Hi guys. Hi. How are you? Hi. Uh, really con congratulations. Um, I have I have two copies of this wonderful 
book that you have both helped to shepherd into the world. And congratulations also to Transit Books. I know Adam is here. I saw him in the chat for working tirelessly to bring us the best of translated literature here in the US. I thought I would begin, I figured, by asking you for the benefit of viewers today or readers who have not encountered Tezarizlu before and can't quite place her in Turkish literature or in Turkish political history for you to give us just a little primer about who she was and what made her writing important for you or for the Turkish women writing in her wake or the Turkish writers writing in her wake. Right. Um, so uh, as Spencer mentioned, Tazar is born in 1943 and she dies when uh, she's 43 years old, very tragically, of uh, breast cancer. And um, and she her life is so, so short just because for the majority of her life before she has cancer, she's also treated for bipolar disorder in um, many, many hospitals. She's given electroshock therapy. And I think this sort of informs the the three books that she wrote uh, a collection of short stories and and two very slim novels or or novellas and um she is she leads sort of a, a bohemian life she goes to the austrian high school in istanbul she drops out she travels around europe she spends some time in paris she marries um uh, an, an actor and director there, marries several times, lives in Germany, she lives in Switzerland where she dies. And uh, and she writes these two, um, I guess now they would be called autofictional uh, novels about, about uh, electroshock th therapy and about mental illness, both of them very, very fragmented. And what's interesting is that there's such internal works and she's writing uh these in in the 70s a really really um a time of extreme political turmoil in turkish history leading up to the 1980 uh, coup d'etat so i think this just this alone makes her work very interesting for me and for for many readers and 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 many women as well that she was able to a lot of the i'm sure maureen can say more about this but it, it I mean, the majority of um, all the literature that I know from this period is uh, very political, um, you know, socialist literature and, and, and literature of the people. And yep. then we have our, our, our nationalist literature. And yes. then there's Hazar Özde, and even, you know, even women writing in, in, in the 70s do have this um, agenda. And then you have Tezer Özde, and I don't really know any other writers like her in, in Turkish literature, definitely not from this really uh, fraught period, um, who is very in, inward looking. Um, and I think she she is connected to uh, intellectual political group of writers, but she, uh, and, and they're very good friends with her, very good friends with Leyla Erbil, um, a revolutionary feminist Turkish writer, very good friends with Ferit Edgü. Her brother uh, is um, politically engaged as well. And um, and she is a totally different and unique in, in her voice. She says at one point in Cold Nights of Childhood, in, in Maureen's translation, I was never part of a revolutionary struggle, not during the 12th March era and not after it either. All I ever wanted was to be free to think and act beyond the tedious limits set by the petty bourgeoisie. And I think we'll get back to that question of her, her politics and what it means to opt not to be part of a revolutionary struggle or consider yourself not part of a revolutionary struggle. But Maureen, I thought first perhaps you could give us a sense of the flavor of how Tezar Özlü thinks and acts beyond the tedious limits set by the petit bourgeoisie. What does this sound like in your English rendering of it? Could you read a little bit for us? Sure. Um, I'll read from um, about, a, uh, about a, a quarter of the way in. 
thoughts of death chase after me. Day and night, I think about killing myself. My reasons, unclear. To carry on with life or to die, either will do. A vague disquiet, nothing more. Troubled thoughts pushing me towards giving suicide a try. Late one night, I rise from bed to walk into darkness, everyone else deep in their usual slumber. The house is cold. I take care to make no noise. I gulp down all the pills I've been gathering for days now. Then I eat some bread and jam to keep from vomiting them up. I'm a young girl. For days now, I've been making the necessary preparations to ensure that my dead body looks beautiful, as if a beautiful dead body were a way of taking revenge. I'm objecting to these houses, these armchairs and carpets, these teachers, this music, these rules. I'm screaming. You can have your little world. I'm screaming. In silence, I go back to bed. Hardly any time left to think about death and nothingness. All I can see now are brightly colored fields. Nothing to fear now. I'm running across fields as if I can no longer bear life by the sea. Nothing but fields now, as far as the eye can see, alone in the breeze and the fields of grass. Soon, very soon, death will take me. I open my eyes to a dirty pillowcase. Embroidered on it are two letters, initials that tell me I am in a psychiatric clinic. They saved me, I think. If only they hadn't, I begin to cry. You know, it's a... It's an interesting it's an interesting scene because on the one hand it's it's gravely serious on the other hand I Shigul, I think you and I were both smiling a little bit as Maureen was reading there's something quite funny about the way she can't quite commit to her own suicide Maureen what do you what do you make of that and how how does that kind of non committal sense that one gets from Tezaruzlu, that vague sense of disquiet. Uh, how how does that how does that compel you to place her in Turkish literature of the time, Turkish feminist literature? I'm thinking of of other literature that you've been translating from around the same period, like Soysal's Dawn. Uh, how how do you place that tone? But what I uh, what I almost stopped when I was reading it to explain where she was when uh, when this was happening, which is uh, in an ultra Kemalist um, um, household of um, teachers who dedicated their lives and were determined that their teachers that their children dedicate their lives um, uh, to the the cause of the republic, the the glorious cause, and. That was so strong at that time in uh, in, in in that side of type of, in that sort of place and that sort of family, and uh, uh, it's it's just another um, straitjacket. Uh, it is for her the main straitjacket that she just wants to get out of. And if if I um, almost smiled while I was reading it, it's because I remember being a teenager and just wanting to jump out of my um, my skin. And also, but not really knowing what that meant and, and not really, you know, having fantasies or having dreams about how I would look um, when people found me when I was gone and so on. I didn't have that particular dream, but it just makes a lot of uh, sense to me. And um, I also think you know, she was possibly because of um, her, her bipolar um illness, which was never really or well, never, ever understood during her uh, lifetime, she had a keen understanding of what was um, uh, preventing her from thinking, um, what was telling her that it was wrong to think. Um, and all she wanted was just to breathe, just to uh, be free. She wanted to die so she could breathe, which is uh, uh, not just an adolescent um, paradox. And um, I show you, I mean, I was rereading your wonderful uh, introduction this, uh, today. And I was struck again by um, how when you were searching for your place in Turkish letters and really trying to do a dutiful job, what a liberation uh, her books were for you. And I was just wondering if I, could, if, if I might be able to ask that. It's just, how did you respond to her voice, her I mean, to me, it's very refreshing. This was also before I figured out, well, I don't actually need to belong you know, to um, some linear 
you know, linear tradition, but it still was very refreshing to discover that there was a, a woman uh, writing, you know, so many decades before, and she was just, you know, she was just doing her own thing. And, um, and her influences were, uh, you know, Kafka and Pavese and very different influences than what I assume her contemporaries were, her Turkish contemporaries were reading. And she really did, you know, just go off and, um, yeah. and sort of explore her mind and, and explore her writing. Yeah. Um, without, so that was very, very interesting for me as a young writer. Yeah, without being uh, opposed to the, her revolutionary friends. Um, but I do also have, because I'm, uh, I suppose, what is that, about 10 years younger than um, she was uh, at that, yeah, then. And I remember um, the, uh, the, the the constraints of solidarity that every um, good um, uh, student revolutionary or in, in intellectual felt um, compelled to, um, to stay inside, and of course they they were up against um, terrible um, foes, and so there was a reason for the solidarity. But uh, the you know as Sevgi Soysal is you know, trying to critique this from inside uh, in a certain way, um, Tezer is saying, "No, this is I, I love you all, but uh, I I um, don't." I mean, she she had a sense of that this was all. Um, she had a very bodily sense of um, of the constraints that she was under that that was keeping her inside her um, her her body, and that's there's actually been really interesting scholarship in Turkey about um, the um, the body politics, literally body politics that she um, just viscerally um, explores. And Marie, oh, sorry, sorry. Can, do you want to go? Go ahead. I was going to say uh, last summer we were uh, Maureen and I were discussing how you know it's easy to call this book daring because of because of the body politics and you know because of when it was written and you know written by a Turkish woman but then we thought is it really daring or is that you know sort of our is that a an assumption that we're making about that time and about the women of that time to even call the you know the the body politics of this work you know daring or like something really extraordinary well to call it daring would be to mark her as being exceptional and to me one of the really interesting tensions in the novel or the novella is the way that the voice is always oscillating between that exceptional disordered shattering i that moves really rapidly across time and space and a very strong we and an attempt to always generalize this experience to put it in the context of what her friends are feeling and how they're reacting in ways that are similar or dissimilar from from her and Maureen I wonder if I could ask you to read a section where that really jumped out at me for those who have the book at home this is on page 41. And to set the scene for you, um, uh, our, our narrator uh, is, is thinking about or is, is, is spending time with her friend Gunk. And there is this meditation on how similar their family lives are. And that meditation allows the, the voice, the narrative voice, to transition from this very insistent I to a we. Uh, and, and Maureen, if you could read that for us, I wonder if we could use that to kind of to to probe this this question that you raised, Aisha Gul, of, of how daring or exceptional or extraordinary she is. <clears throat> During those autumns, winters, springs, and summers, we're still children. But in the place of childhood joy, there's a strange disgruntlement, a seeping misery, a growing unease about our teacher parents and the narrow houses of our Muslim neighborhoods, about our church school's Catholic atmosphere and its nuns peculiar and to us incomprehensible behavior, and the lack of other teachers, other ways of learning that might give our thoughts direction, that might help us make sense of the lives awaiting us. What we need most to understand what life is, to come to terms with it, 
Instead, the real world into which we must descend stands before us like an alien object, like the globe they bring out in geography class. No one mentions that life is none other than the days, nights, and seasons through which we pass. We sit there waiting for the sign, preparing for what? Now that I am living in that future that rushes forever forward, no one is preparing me for anything anymore. Instead, I look at the Asian shores of the Bosphorus, turned to shadows by the rising sun, and the bearded fishermen in their rubber boots and oilskin selling fish in front of the magnificent old yellows, and the huge new cars and the avenues, the people, the crowds, and the drunk who walks under the bridge shouting curses, and the friend who holds him by the arm to keep him from falling, and the passengers boarding the funicular at Cunel, and the fancily dressed people rushing into the marriage bureau with bouquets, and the posters plastered on walls, and the Bayola beer halls, a new one every day, and the people queuing up for shared taxis, and the striking workers, and the troops lined up in Taksim Square, and the young soldiers with their rifles guarding the banks. I see them all through my own eyes. What more could I want? We grow up inside an anger that grows with us, the neighborhood in which we live, the dead end, the rooms and the furniture, the old bedstead with its broken springs and its cotton mattress that caves in at the middle. We grow up hating them all. The only life is in the streets. The streets are jumping with it. The city's beauty is in its people and its crowd. What's real is the outside world. The outside world is calling to us, ringing in our ears, singing of other lands, of an ocean to the west of us and another ocean to the east. So it's, it's I, I, I mean, I love those three paragraphs. And for those who don't have the book, if you look at it, the first paragraph is here. And then the second, where it switches back to the eye is in this kind of long parenthetical. And then in the next paragraph, it switches back to the we. But Maureen, as you were reading, I was thinking about what Aishigu said about this being a deeply interior, almost autofictional or proto-autofictional book. But where she lands in that last paragraph is that real life is with the crowds, real yeah. life is the streets, real life is what is outside of us. Yeah. How, do you, how do you square that? How do you square that circle? What do you what do you make of that tension between that insistent inwardness and then the assertion that real life is with the people, the crowds, the masses in the streets? Uh I what I what I love about this um, book is that it's insisting um, on um, its own way of looking, and that's the self. It's not, uh, oh, me, 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 um, what is wrong with me? There's none of that. Even when she's describing horrible torture at, at, at the hands of, uh, of her, her doctors and, 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 and nurses and indeed relatives and friends, yeah? She, when she's writing this book, she's trying to um, not just to, take herself, but also us um, through those things, uh, you know, not ignoring them to, um, uh, to, the, um, to the present, to the instant, to the moment, to the, 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 the beauty of the step, uh, to the, uh, the, um, to the beauty of the streets, to, um, and, and that is what she's, uh, and, and she's over and over again in different ways. Uh, she's, saying, as in that first paragraph, you know, we were pre prepared for the life that was going to happen next that nobody really knew what it was going to be, but actually it's here, it's here, it's here. So when I was reading the, the book this uh, today, um, happily as a, as a reader, as opposed to a translator looking for it, um, I just found it really flowed. It really flowed despite all of the disjunctures, despite all of the, 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 um, uh, the really disturbing and distressing things. She's she's flowing across those things, uh, not captured by the by any of them, to take us to the the, the places where she joins with um, uh, the crowds and um, and nature. There's a lot of nature um, that, that's there waiting to be seen. Well, that there's also that, um, reminded me of this is really I find it really really annoying actually, but. Um, you know, in Tezeros is called the the melancholy princess of Turkish literature. I don't know if Yopukredi came up with this, but somehow it caught on and everyone calls her the melancholy princess. Um, but there, there is uh, 
I mean, it, it, she does switch back and forth between this like intensity and like lyrical um, melancholia. Well, so, yeah. There's also a kind of, there's something grammatically interesting here, right? And how Turkish uses the first person plural or is much more comfortable switching from the first person singular to the first person plural in ways that we notice in English, but in, in Turkish, we might not necessarily mark or register in the same way, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I figure you'd be a better uh, authority on this. Um, it's just that um, I don't notice it when I'm reading Turkish or listening to Turkish. I notice it when I try to take it into English. Um, um, just as also the shifting between uh, the past and the present uh, is much easier in Turkish, as is the shift from the active voice to the passive voice. Uh, and and um, that is one of the, the things that makes um, um, beautiful Turkish flow so beautifully, you know, literary Turkish um, at its best, yeah. So, and I guess there is also the, this, you know, the sense of capacious time in Turkish, right? The Yenis Zaman, which yeah. is, which I think sort of goes hand in hand with, with um, all of these other things, you know, the sense of, you know, taking in the crowds. Yeah, of, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's it's um it's as opposed to um, the the solidarity of the collective, which is also very strong and, and historically very very necessary. It is it is closer to um, something uh, in um, the Sufi traditions, where yeah, because not the uh, yeah, but it's just being at one at one at one with uh, with with all with all, and uh, but no religion. No religion um, in this vision of, of hers, as she says to her religious grandmother, every time her grandmother prays, God does not exist. And then her, her grandmother says, God forbid, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's also a capaciousness of geography here, right? We can't, yes, yes. we can't tell whether, sometimes we can't tell whether we're in Istanbul, whether we're in Paris. Uh, she is reading uh, the Russians as a child quite obsessively. And then later when she's institutionalized, the kind of cultural reference point that we have for that institutionalization is the film version of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest yeah. with Jack Nicholson. Uh, what, do you, what do you two make of, make of that? Because on the one hand, the, the cold nights of childhood that are remembered, there is a kind of prov provincial or insular beauty to, to them. Uh, and on the other hand, the kind of cultural geography that's traced by this novel is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly wide reaching. Uh, how do you how do you think about that? And how do you how does it how does it change the way you understand you understand her and her relationship to uh, to the, the nation, the idea of the nation or the, the republic or nationality? I show you. I'm going to let you go first on that. Well, I had the sense when I was reading that she sort of mocks it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, this sort of switching from place to place and not taking any place very seriously, that, you know, that we would be explained the context. And it could be Paris, it could be Berlin, but whatever, I'm really not doing so well. That, you know, there is that sense of, of not taking nationalism or national borders very seriously. Um, she or also, husbands, yeah. Or even husbands. yeah, they they come and they go, they they live and they die. The husbands, yeah. Yes, but. yes, yes, exactly. And I mean, it's also obviously mimetic of some sort of madness, right? That um, that you're you're within your own body and your consciousness, and the the outside world sort of rushes you by, and therefore countries and cities don't really matter very much. Again, rereading it today and, and, and responding it so differently um, uh, instead of the, 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 the slow, um, intense pace of translation and the, the translation itself. Uh, I found a continu I found continuities that I hadn't um, noticed before. Um, it is, uh, it's all, you know, it's, it's jumping from place to place. Uh, you're in the, you're in the, the school teacher's house in in uh, in old Istanbul, Fintfati, and and then the next uh, next paragraph here in the the countryside uh, where they used to live uh, and that she misses, and then 
and then you're back and forth in time. So it is, there's a lot of um, uh, disjunction, which of course, when you're translating, you notice very, very neatly, but, but it all, you, in each of the four uh, ch uh, chapters of very different lengths that she, um, uh, that, that she has in the, this novella, there is something, there's, there's a unity to each, there's something that she's, uh, trying to say and in, in fact that's trying to build on or that, that succeeds in building on one by one it is her own it's her own path it's her own trajectory um uh and um uh, I, I feel I just remember in your introduction you're just talking about um how much you liked meeting a Turkish uh, woman writer who was simply without rebelling just finding her own path um through her through her reading through her free reading yeah and that was yes yes and Maureen you and I I think discussed that the only writer who's, who's similar to her in some ways is Said Faik who yeah. also is very yeah. respectful of of the yeah. national struggle and he says but I'm just going to you know write about the people of the island and the fishermen and you know going mad yeah yeah uh so but they're the um uh, the the quiet dissidents of of the literary world um in which um the um the rules were you know the rules of solidarity if you want to call them they were uh they were necessary because so many uh writers were you know ending up in jail uh and getting the different kind of electroshocks so they, they really had to um um I, would, I, I admire the solidarity um, that I don't see very much uh, here uh, mm -hmm. in Britain. Yeah, but uh, the they both thought uh, very subtly and quietly for themselves. Yeah, uh, well, they, where, where they were they were both keeping that company. For anybody who doesn't know Said Faik, he he um, was the you know the great short storyteller of the mid twentieth century, if we, if we can, you know, uh, and. Uh, and he was um, uh, his sexuality is um, un unclear, apparently. Uh, but it's basically he didn't he didn't belong. He didn't uh, he didn't fit in. He suffered a great deal in lots of ways, and so he has this. Uh, he's, he's standing outside. He's standing mm -hmm. outside, um, understanding everything, a part of everything, but really. Um, really um, most interested in the the streets that. Uh, that Tezera is, is describing in, in, in that passage that um, that you chose for me to read. You know, just to, to bring together uh, two things, one that one from each of you, you know, Aisha, you, you mentioned that you feel like the, the form of the novella is, is mimetic of a kind of madness. And Maureen, you just said that uh, you just compared the kind of electroshock therapy that we see her undergoing to the electroshock therapy that the political dissidents were undergoing in, or a different kind of electroshock uh, torture that they were undergoing in prisons. And I actually want to bring those two things together and just, just try out something, which is, I wonder if the form of the novel is the form of a kind of shock therapy. Uh, yeah. that each chapter is kind of shocking us into a new memory without a beginning, uh, with a beginning, with an end, but with no midpoint, as she describes yeah, it. So yeah, it, yeah. it starts yeah. and stops, but there doesn't seem to be a kind of fully developed. <laughs> and when she's describing electroshock therapy, uh, she says, um, she says, who knows, maybe they didn't get the current <laughs> they need, the city's current in other words. So there really is a, a direct kind of bodily connection between like the electricity that lights up the city, the currents of the city and the current that is coursing through her body and the bodies of the of the dissidents. And so maybe the kind of solidarity is taking place on the level of the, the current, which is the the, the level of the, or the form of, of this yeah. of this novel. I wonder how that strikes you. Well, I'm just looking at uh, that that extraordinary passage in which um, she um, recreates her thought processes at a time when she's not supposed to have any. What she when people say they don't happen, but but she puts them in there. And uh, uh, at the end, she just said, "I'm not angry. They only want what's best for me. Can this be natural? Is it even possible to go through this and still be thinking? But maybe it's natural." And then she says, "I am dying. The revolutionary struggle must continue without me." 
And and then she goes on to say, no, it's not the um, it, it's not what you think. It's not the twelfth of March or anything afterwards. It's uh, um, but there was there was something there was there was a there was a revolution um, that she was uh, inevitably you know not by choice um, part of and that she was fighting and that she kind of understood that at coming out of or coming out of uh, or during uh, electroshock therapy that she felt she felt not solidarity with um, but at one I mean I think there's a there's a big and very important difference in in her lexicon between solidarity which is not a word I think she uses very much there but being at one one. Right. I mean, I should give this is a novel. I don't think I'm spoiling anything, but this is a novel that ends with a woman orgasming, right? Uh, and it 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 links that that orgasm, that wetness to the ocean, uh, in that kind of feeling of oneness that you're describing, Maureen. What do you what do you make of the ending, which actually did seem quite daring? Quite <laughs> daring. I mean, I actually, you know, the, I don't know if a book, unless it's, you know, a, a genre book with so many orgasms in it, and they just <laughs> come quiet, and you're like, oh, another one, and another one. <laughs> so it is, and then by the end, so it, it sort of makes sense that um, it ends with with this pattern. You totally convinced me about the structure of the of the electroshock. I hadn't I hadn't thought about it, but the the orgasm is I guess sort of a counterpoint to that, a similar feeling, but you know, more internal and more of one's own, belonging to to herself rather than inflicted upon her. Right, that's and, great. I love that. I love that. I love that. The current, two different kinds of current, one kind of supplied by the the infrastructure of the city, the other supplied by her own internal infrastructure. I really love that. Go ahead. Uh, and there is a continuity um, um, to the, um, the, the, the the orgasm strand, if you want to call it that, because um, she talks very openly, very directly about um, the um, you know, the first orgasms um, with the, the, this experimenting with her her sister and her and her cousins. And um, and then they were hoping that there would be this kind of orgasm with men and that so doesn't. So doesn't happen, and and then it uh, and then it kind of happens, but it doesn't. But it's this is um, she ends with the orgasm, which was a real challenge to take into English. I must tell you. Right. Wait, oh, tell yeah. us what, what was what's the challenge of having orgasms in English? It's just the um, like French. Um, Turkish is is more comfortable with abstractions um, and abstractions floating around, hitting against other abstractions, and so on. Whereas, um, as much as um, you know, we go into translation. We uh, go into translation uh, to um, uh, to, um, to to knock against the Anglo-Saxon uh, mind and way of looking at things, and and to um, you know mix things up. It's still, um, it's, and also because English is so embarrassed about any emotion, uh, it all, um, they, and um, one of the wonderful things about translating Turkish is that I can, I can have an, you know, I can feel, I can share an emotion and, and take it seriously. So all that uh, means that you re- need to be very, very careful about your choice of words, or else it sounds silly um, when you know something in Turkish. If something in Turkish sounds so beautiful and so powerful. Um, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm failing and um, I'm dishonoring. I'm dishonoring the orgasm <laughs> if I um, if if I let if I get it wrong. Yeah, if I, if I don't. Maureen, quite... it's such a gorgeous translation. Thank you. Thank you. And because I would have loved it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, the, the, we. The, the haunting, one of the haunting things is uh, that um, obviously I didn't know her, but she lived in all the same places. And my father used to go to all those mehanas, the, you know, the uh, the drinking places. And her great friend, Hayalit Oz, was a great friend of my father's. And he was always at our house. And every time he came to our house for a party, um, he would he would borrow, steal a few books so much so that my father would just say, um, Come over, but choose the books you want to steal. <laughs> so he was, 
Uh, so it's just so much. Um, uh, I was on the periphery, but of the of enough on the periphery of it to um, to, to uh, know that world and, um, and 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 see it flowing. I had no idea that she had lived in Arnoitke, which was very close to where I grew up and where I went to school. So uh, yeah. Well, so, I would I would read an entire essay by you on your fear of dishonoring the orgasm, Maureen, but. <laughs> Uh, until until that essay is written, I'm going to turn to the chat for to open up our Q and A. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat, and I'll probably intersperse some questions with the Q and A. So the first one from an anonymous attendee: What was Özlü's publishing journey in Turkey like? Was it very challenging for her as a woman writing about atheistic beliefs and such intense experiences that the country might have censored? Was it very challenging for her to get? published. Uh, you know, Maureen, if I remember correctly, it, it wasn't. And I think because she was, she had so many friends um, who were writers who were willing to publish her. I think Ferit Edgu uh, published her yeah. Uh, yeah. and edited her at, at some point. And I think her, because she died so young, I believe her short stories were published um, after her death by her sister. Yeah. I mean, I think she had some short stories um, early on. I mean, that's a, 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 a kind of a classic way for Turkish writers to come in into, onto the scene because it's a really, and has always been since the first days of the Republic, a very, very lively publishing scene with lots and lots of journalists and small, but very um, passionately committed, yeah? So she would have been part of that. And her brother, uh, her brother went first. He may have taken himself a bit more seriously, but she was in there. And to the point, the answer to question about um, uh, uh, about atheism, um, it, the at at that time um, it was it was more dangerous to write about God. <laughs> but it was it was a you know it was the secular age and uh, uh, the the problems that the um, uh, the intelligentsia, the literary intelligentsia, had the embattled intelligentsia it was was um, against the power of the state um, and, and trying to um, open up um, uh, spaces and discussions that were forbidden. Um, it was, um, and in fact, uh, as again, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to explain what was, for, how much was forbidden during those, during those days and how important the cloistered conversations amongst writers were to, um, for us all really. You know, Maureen, I this this links to a question that I had for you, which was, I uh, you know the the last event that you and I did together was on Dawn, uh, a text from about ten years before Cold Nights of Childhood, and I'm wondering if for you there is a larger project here to bring Turkish women writers into English, Turkish women writers who, I don't want to say they're forgotten because they really haven't ever been present to English readers in, in any way. Uh, but yeah, I wonder if there's a larger project for you after having spent years translating Pamuk or after translating the Time Regulation Institute, these kind of big male writers on the scene. If there's a, yeah, what, what the, if there's a larger vision here that you are putting together or participating in. Um, there's, uh, yes, I mean, that actually the first book I ever translated that is still not found a publisher was uh, another book by Sevki Soysal about her time in political prison, which is also wonderful. And um, one day we'll find something. I just have it. I, I, I've traveled all over. I think I've moved about 35 times since I translated that thing. I always take it with me. Um, so, hey, books, uh, Adam, what are you doing? I bet we have a bunch of publishers <laughs> Room. Somebody should be jumping on this archipelago. I mean, I'm sure. Come on, people, get with the program here. Okay, uh, but um, so it was always there that when the, the time I was a uh, young adult starting to write my own novels and so on, um, the um, it was uh, a woman writer who opened up um, the the world to me that had been closed. Uh, partly because, you know, I was an American living in Turkey. Um, I'm not uh, not not. In, invited into things, but also because it was a very male world. And uh, and, and and she was opening up um, uh, this other place, um, this other world. Um, 
the um, the Orhan years, my seven Orhan years, uh, which I don't regret, um, were also very difficult, um, partly for, because of um, personality reasons, but also because of what Orhan himself went through, and therefore I went through with him because of the the hate campaign uh, that that that, uh, that 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 he endured. Um, and uh, it got, you know, those those hate campaigns do really um, eat into everything. And uh, uh, I wasn't ever going to translate again. I really wasn't. And uh, and then I decided because I was so keenly aware of the century of great writing that was just not, you know, it was not it didn't exist out in, in English. And it was, was making me really, really angry. So when thanks to my connection with Orhan, I started getting offered um, various um, uh, you know, classics, you know, like Said Tvaik, uh, like Tom Bernard and so on. I just thought, well, this is something I can do. And and uh, and also, um, I won't, they won't talk back. Uh, or, to, uh, and so we uh, that went on. But then um, it was during the, um, uh, I'm always in touch with the scholars, um, uh, Turkish, uh, diaspora and inside Turkish scholars, literary scholars, who are doing such incredibly interesting work on bringing um, um, the, the, the women writers who've been forgotten in Turkey uh, back and doing wonderful scholarship on them and getting them back into print. And uh, it's only thanks to them that uh, these uh, books started coming, uh, being offered to publishers in, uh, in, in the Anglophone world. And I was just so lucky because just when the pandemic hit, I was offered three women authors um, who are all really, really interesting. The Swat Dervish, who's who's a riot, you know, who's from the early um, the early days of the early republic, very, very different kind of writer. And then uh, and then Sevgi Soisal and then uh, Tazer Özlü. And so they were my companions uh, throughout the pandemic. And uh, and um, they'll be my companions uh, um, forever. There are there are other books by them that are um, um, that are there to be translated and there are other um, other translators translating other women and there's as you said uh, Aisha in your in your um, introduction this is kind of a golden age for um, um, what women writing of the self but not just of the self from the self looking out yeah and uh, it's, it's, yeah you know, today I, I made a list and I just wanted, I was very curious to look up the dates of these books because as Mavis said, there are these books coming out. They, they're they not forgotten classics or they're not because they're, they were never forgotten. They just weren't translated. They're very well known in their own languages. And for me, Tazeros, it really fits within these women. And I just found it so curious that they were published all around the same time. Um, Tove Ditlipson's Copenhagen trilogy. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and these books about institutionalization and mental health and loneliness and, and also being, you know, a mother. Uh, Tsushima's Territory of Light. So one is 79, the other is 1971. Then there is, I thought, you know, the, the Betty Howard books that were recommissioned. So I guess that was a forgotten, forgotten book about her time in a psychiatric institute. There's Cesare Ozu, there's, you know, this interest in Helen Garner and the Helen Garner yeah, running. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 1977. It's yeah. this, and I'm, I was a bit puzzled, actually, just thinking about how all these books are being translated or being reissued at the same time and, and sort of what our interest in that is. And Marvin, maybe you have a more intelligent thing to say say about this. Well, no, I was thinking too, as actually, as I was reading the, the novelist who kept coming to my mind, who's doing something like this, but in a much more maximalist form is Ingeborg Bachmann. So I was thinking about Malina yeah. Uh, yeah. When, I was, when I was reading this, which has a similar kind of inwardness uh, and almost kind of whirlpool of, of interiority that's operating in a similar way. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, I should be like, I think, I think one answer to it might just be that people love inaugurating new genres. So everyone thinks autofiction is some new thing that, that happened in 2010 or 2011. I, but in fact, when you read a little with, with a slightly, uh, with, with, when you read with more historical savvy 
And when you read outside of English, you start finding that what Anglophone readers want to claim as a generic novelty, in fact, has a very, very, very long history in other languages. And I wonder if institutionalization, which is such a scene for grappling with the self and the shattering of the self and the reconstitution of the self, is offering itself up as a kind of generic forerunner to what is hot in the anglophone world now. So that's one that's one explanation that comes that comes immediately to to my mind at least and it's not a I have no like problem with that with that justification but but you're right that this is a this is a moment for it. I mean the other thing too is just to look at or think about what what was happening with with feminism and with revolutionary struggle in that in that 70s moment and what it was authorizing women writers to to say that they might otherwise not have felt like they could commit even to even to writing before yeah i think that um, uh, with my background in comparative literature mostly latin american and Euro european um north american and and of course uh, uh turkish um, the other thing that's happening now is we have a golden age of translation, uh, of literary translation, and uh, and so what's happening that one of these wonderful things that's happening almost uh, by itself is these women uh, writers uh, at the um, in the first years of second wave feminism, if we're going to call it that, in the midst of the Cold War, uh, uh, in the midst of all of those political struggles which were very uh, male dominated, that they're trying to. Um, uh, they're trying in um, in cultural isolation. In other words, they're not able to talk to each other. So, you know, um, uh, Tezera they can't speak to uh, Clarice Lispector or something, but they're all doing um, uh, a lot of, so many of them on the margins of the Cold War where actually everything happened. Um, it's just that, you know, the guys in Washington didn't notice, yeah? And, and so the wonderful thing about their coming into translation is they, these books can now be in conversation with each other in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, they cannot; they don't have to be alone anymore. And I think it's a, that's a, that it's the the way the books talk to each other, um, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the possibility of bringing more books in um, uh, to this conversation. That's um, that that's my happy dream. Well, it's also interesting, right? Because often they are grappling with some of the same male father figures or influences, right? Uh, yeah. But but now once they are brought into translation, you can see how they how those 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 male father figures only become these kind of auxiliary players for them to speak to one another. And yes. so what was previously kind of hierarchical becomes more horizontal. It becomes a yes. more horizontal, more global conversation, not through influence, but through, I mean, it's something like the current, right? It goes back to that image of the of the current that we were talking about before. It's a current that's kind of bringing all of these, all of these women together and it's not originating from any one place, but it's coursing through all of them at the same time. So, and you're making that possible, which is what, which is, yeah. which, is which is, yeah, which is just such I a joy to see. It's really important to, um, to remember that we're all making this hospital this possible uh, because um, these books don't arrive uh, on my lap or anybody's lap um, by them by themselves. And so it is um, we have, you know, the publishers who have uh, taken an interest in this take at great you know taking risks um, in order to make the, uh, these things happen. Um, uh, it just wouldn't happen with, uh, with without um, without happiness uh, to do <laughs> for it all of us yeah and, I, think, uh, and also, yeah, yeah i think on that i think on that note uh aisha good maureen you are what five hours six hours ahead of me on the east coast so i think we should say good night and thank you so much this was such a wonderful conversation i feel i feel very moved and i feel like i understand this novel in a in a deeper and more expansive way because of it. I hope everyone in the audience had a good time. You can order Cold Nights of Childhood from the various links that Spencer is dropping into the chat. Uh, Transit Books, Get On Publishing, uh, <laughs> all, uh Prison Journals, please. Uh, uh, and um, if you do, I'll write about them. Uh, and thank you everybody, <laughs> thank you everybody for a great event. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah, so much everyone for joining us. Um, have a wonderful evening or morning or afternoon. Um, please be well. Um, and uh, to the three of you, take care and until next time. Thank you Bye. very much. Next time, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zinnett.